Okay, uh, it's still morning. Uh, good morning to you all. Uh, and Oh, shouldn't be wearing this. That's the reason I'm wearing this hat, I'll tell you later on. And thanks uh, to the organizing committee for the kind invitation and uh, a great lecture by uh, Yasek. And I'll try to see if I can uh, try to do as, <laughs> as well as uh, he did. Uh, so this is part of our mini uh, course with uh, Andrea Pugliesi, who is sitting at the back right there. So I will, yes, I will talk a little bit about uh, mathematical introduction to mathematical epidemiology. And tomorrow he will give a lecture in the lab. And then I'll give another lecture on uh, uh, the mathematics of climate change on vector-borne diseases. And then he'll do a, a similar lecture. And so on. then we give uh, group exercises. Um, it's great to be back here at Ames. I've been here many times since uh, the very beginning, and it was interesting to hear the, uh, the uh, discussion uh, earlier on by uh, Indifon about the history of Ames. Um, I think, but I felt that uh, as he was talking, I needed to add a few more things uh, to, to the history because the, the project, Ames project, is really something compelling, something that has been really fantastic for the continent of Africa. And it's, it's all really down to Neil and many others. And I think John Hargrove is here. He's also one of the key players. Uh, of course, Jacek is here too and, and, and many other people. So the last time I was here, I think, was the graduation for Ames. The reason I like this picture is this people from all over Africa, so there are people from Sudan, from North Africa, from East Africa, West Africa, and so on. So it was right here, uh, graduation uh, for the AIMS students. The idea of AIMS is to select students from across Africa. It's a pan-African program. Uh, those are students who have already completed their undergraduate degree in mathematics, and they needed like nine months program to help them uh, 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 bridge the gap in their training so that they can go to places like Cambridge, Oxford, uh, and, and so on. So some of the AIM students are actually here now. So that's really the idea. So we have talented students from across Africa, much with talented faculty who volunteer their time to come from different parts of the world to come here, and also from within Africa to come and teach those talented students. So these are some of the students who graduated a few years ago, and I happen to be uh, here at the time. And this was at a Neil in his apartment in Waterloo. Uh, this was me still. And this is a former student of Ames who was with me in Manitoba in Canada, uh, Desalin, doing his uh, master's and PhD. Uh, this is also an Ames alumni at Simon Fraser University. So the reason I shown this picture is uh, Neil called me one time and he said, oh, you need to come to Perimeter Institute because there's going to be some big announcement. And he didn't tell me what it was, but he just said, I should come. So I came and, and then this happened. The, this is Prime Minister, former Prime Minister of Canada, uh, uh, Stephen Harper, who announced that day at the Perimeter Institute $20 million uh, funding for AIMS to replicate AIMS Musenberg. This one in four other places, four other cities, or uh, four other countries in Africa. So in Ghana, in, uh, in Tanzania, in Cameroon, and in, uh, what's the other one, Senegal. So that's. So this is Canadian contribution to that. Um, and of course, every time I come here, a lot of great things happen at Ames. So this is a, a luncheon happening with Neil. And his, this is his mom. I think he said something really funny. Everybody was laughing. And so it was at the house of the, uh, I think, British High Commissioner here in Stellenbosch. We were having lunch at the time. But something that was important was this person was actually standing somewhere here. Stephen Hawking was right here talking with AIM students, and he was somewhere there, just at the corner there. So great things happen at AIMS all the time, and, uh, and it's really down to the great vision of Neil Turok. And I think his parents also helped in making sure that we have this building uh, as a part of uh, AIMS. So it's, it's really a great story, and great things are, are happening. Anyway, so I just thought I should clarify that uh, uh, before I start my formal talk. Oh yes, before that also Neil announced that uh, the next Einstein is going to come from Africa. So last month we had the global gathering 
of uh, the next Einstein Forum. So he started this next Einstein Forum, some of us including uh, uh, Christian Rousseau and uh, I think Yasek was there too in Dakar, and we do. The, the, the vision is that the next Einstein is going to come from Africa. And Neil said it's not only going to come from Africa, it's actually going to be a female from Africa. <laughs> so that's fantastic. Well done, Neil. So that's why I'm wearing this hat, you see, so for that reason. Okay, back to my, uh, my discussion. Uh, so I'm talking about uh, the basic comic mechanic type model. So it's really building on to what Yasek has talked about. Um, so he's already introduced many of the main concepts that I'll talk about. But I'm focusing more on mathematical epi epi uh, epidemiology. And please feel free at any point in time to ask me questions. I really like people interacting with me. Ask me if I say anything you don't agree with, just yell or at least talk to me and say something. Okay, so burden of some infectious diseases. Because of things like this, we will always be in business. We meaning people doing mathematical modeling of infectious diseases. Okay, so like smallpox uh, killed about 300 million people in the 19th century alone. Uh, the 1918-1919 pandemic of influenza, of course we know the fatalities. Uh, malaria is still killing one to two million people every year. HIV AIDS uh, killed 25 million. Um, then we had the 2014 Ebola outbreaks and so on. Again, the, the idea is uh, diseases are very much around and we need to apply mathematical modeling and analysis to gain insight into what is actually going on and to hopefully devise effective mechanisms within which we can control those uh, diseases. So I just gave a list of, a, a small list of diseases that are of huge uh, public health body. Okay, so another reason why we should worry also is globalization and public health. Okay, this, the theme of this workshop is on global change. So, but globalization uh, means that what's happening here could have a non-trivial consequence in far away places. And this quote from Doran Sass outbreaks in Canada actually was what I always uh, like to highlight. Is it says that this, the disease, severe acute respiratory syndrome has illustrated the fact that we're constantly a short flight away from a major epidemic because of globalization, globalization. So, so we're vulnerable to what's happening in faraway places. In other words, we are in, in this together, okay? So when there's outbreak of Ebola in uh, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea, the whole world was interested in this because of, again, this issue of globalization. Okay, so what's the role of mathematical modeling? It's a very difficult question to answer. But I tried to summarize some of the reasons why we need to model uh, the spread of diseases. I think it's, in general, it's, it's difficult to say precisely what the role of modeling is, but it's some of the, at least some of the definitions one can give is, to, okay, we use model or modeling to actually try to build, to test different hypotheses, okay? Or the conjectures that public health people may have at the beginning of an outbreak. They may say, well, okay, this is a disease that's probably preventable using a vaccine or maybe basic control measures like isolation, quarantine, and so on. So you can test all these hypotheses or conjectures using mathematical modeling to try to see which ones make sense and which ones may not necessarily make sense. Or you can use modeling also to compare, plan, to implement, and to evaluate uh, various uh, control strategies. Uh, so preventive strategies, detection strategies, therapeutic strategies, and so on. And I think for me, I tend to emphasize more the third option or the third point is to identify trends. It's always a problem in modeling when you give absolute numbers to say, okay, there will be 20 cases tomorrow or there will be 200 cases in a week's time. It's always difficult. It's subject to so many uncertainties. It's usually better to focus more on the qualitative aspect of the disease transmission process, trying to identify trends and making general forecasts. One example would be during pandemics. I mean, we typically know from modeling normally that we have uh, two, two paces. The first one is the, the first wave of the disease usually is mild compared to the second wave. So if you're making focus on general qualitative properties of the disease, it's, at, at, it's a little easier, I think, than to be giving the absolute 
numbers. Another point of why modeling is important is you can give early estimates of uh, epidemiological thresholds. And we'll talk a lot in this workshop about R0, R0 the, the uh, basic reproduction number, uh, typically measures the average number of new cases a typical infected person will generate before he or she dies or get cured. Okay, so public health people may want to know the size of this number, like how big it is. If it's like two, means on average I infect two others, you also infect two others, and so on, and before you know it, everybody gets infected. So it's a more serious problem if the value of R0 is large. So using available data and available knowledge of the epidemiology and immunology and so on of the disease, you can try to figure out what uh, R0 is at the beginning, and that could influence uh, control strategies. Um, going forward. Uh, maybe you can estimate also the prevalence of the disease or disease burden, how many people are likely to be infected, how many are likely to require ICU admission, intensive care unit, and so on. Okay, so this is collaborative, okay, this is multidisciplinary in nature, what we do, mathematical epidemiology or mathematical biology in general. So it's a coming together of mathematicians and biologists, epidemiologists and entomologists, statisticians, computer scientists, everybody pretty much to work together, okay, to try to understand, try to address a real problem for the world. Okay, so, so we, we, we have our own wish list, okay, so different communities have their own wish list. So we, we tend to use, so from the mathematical point of view, so we, we, we have these uh, techniques and theories that we use to try to understand the models that we have developed. So typically we're interested in existence and stability of solutions of the models. Uh, with that we can calculate the reproduction number and try to determine effective ways of control. And maybe known existence of certain types of solutions, which again, uh, later on maybe if I have some time I'll say why this is important. There are many different techniques to analyze those models, okay? Since this is a general audience, this is mostly t targeted for a mathematical audience, but since it's a general audience, what we say when you design a model, you have to really do some analysis, at least some basic analysis to understand some of the key properties of the model that you can use to help public health policy people to design effective control strategies. So these are some of the techniques and theories that I, we normally use, um, okay? So the public health people have their wish list in times of epidemics, okay? When the, uh, during the, for example, the 2014 outbreaks of uh, Ebola, uh, they're interested in estimating, of course, what the reproduction number of Ebola is, for example, okay? So it's typically between 1.2, I think to about 1.4. Most studies show something like that. Uh, so at the beginning, they are able to estimate that. And the qualitative nature of the spread of the disease, for example, what is the spreading speed? How fast the disease is spreading? So recently, there's a paper, I think Corey and his group at NASA did a paper showing that the uh, mosquito that causes Zika now has spread to 30 states of the United States as against 12 known before. So it's spreading. So how fast uh, this kind of diseases are spreading? And when is uh, the epidemic likely to die out? Will there be multiple wave phenomena like we saw with the pandemic influenza and so on? And then you can estimate disease burden, expected number of infectious uh, cases, uh, inf sorry, infect infections, and maybe mortality, how many people are likely to be hospitalized or admitted into intensive care units. And you can also assess various control strategies. Public health people are interested in determining which of the control strategies will be most effective. Uh, typically at the beginning of outbreaks, the, the uh, controls, uh, maybe medications are not, um, how, how best do I say that, uh, maybe the control resources are not um, high enough, so they have to share them or they have to be targeted. Uh, so I remember during the H1N1, uh, they didn't have enough timing flu, so they have to determine, okay, who best gets it in order for us to effectively control the disease. Do we target pregnant women? Do we target the elderly? Do we target children? Uh, do we target the healthcare workers? And so on. So these are questions, real questions public health people will need to address. If you have limited resources, how do you optimally allocate those to achieve optimal results? So targeted uh, control strategies. Hard immunity. So hard immunity meaning uh, what proportion of population you need to vaccinate in order for you to have the chance to effectively control the disease. Uh, and so on. Cost of intervention, so now here you put in cost and there may be optimal allocation of those limited resources. Any questions so far? No one is asking questions. <laughs> Where are the brave ones? Okay. I think you should explain very slowly what is the reproduction number. Okay, very good. So 
Excellent. Okay, I shall explain very slowly what the reproduction number is. Okay, very good. So what it means uh, from the epidemiological point of view is the average number of new cases one infected case will generate. Average, on average. So if I'm infected, all of you are not infected. I'm the only one infected, okay? So how many people on average am I going to infect before either I get cured or before I die? Okay? So if on average, if the reproduction number R0 is two, it means I infect two others. So those two, this, I'm the first generation, I'm the first index case, and then the two others are the next generation, they're infected. So he also infects two others, he infects two others. Everybody who's infected can infect on average two others. So you count all the generations, all the new <coughs> cases generated by a typical infection. Of course, we're not counting super spreaders, somebody who infects more than the average. Okay, so on average, one person infects two others. That's what it means from the epidemiological point of view. But from the mathematical point of view, it's really the spectral radius of some matrix. Okay, we do some linear algebra, we calculate some matrices, or we linearize around the disease-free equilibrium, find all the eigenvalues, and require the eigenvalues to have negative real part. That's the, typically how you calculate R0, using standard linearization. Or if you use the next generation operator method, you just need to calculate uh, the spectral radius of the matrix. Okay? Any, is that clear? Excellent, okay, very good. All right. Uh, mathematical wish list, of course, so public health people have their own wish list, so mathematicians also have their wish list. Uh, if once you have the, the model designed, you need to characterize the qualitative dynamics of the model. So you need to know all the equilibrium uh, solutions. So Yasek was talking about stationary points. If you have a fixed point problem, x equals f of x. So values of x that satisfy x equals x, f of x are fixed points. So here typically we set the derivatives to zero, you find all uh, possible equilibrium solutions. In some cases you look for periodic solutions, other types of solutions and so on. So we need to determine the existence of solutions. Under what conditions do those solutions exist? And under what conditions are they stable? Stable meaning under what condition do they attract initial conditions? So uh, under what condition do we actually combat to that particular solution? So there's existence, there's also solution, uh, the stability of solutions. And through that you can then determine uh, the different types of verifications. Again, all those things, we're not just doing them for fun, they, they have non-trivial implications in terms of whether or not diseases uh, can be effectively controlled or not. And in fact, uh, we, we discussed some of them to, uh, with public health people. So verification means a sudden change in the qualitative behavior of the system as you change a parameter. So typically a system is stable and suddenly it becomes unstable as you change the parameter, as you reach a certain value of the parameter. So that system is said to undergo a verification. So there are different types of verifications and some of them really have a non-trivial uh, impact on whether or not the disease is effectively controlled or it persists in the population. There are many different types, forward, backward, hop, and so on. But because this is a general audience, I will uh, skip this uh, quickly. Uh, so we use a series from dynamical systems and techniques. Uh, we can discuss this uh, in detail later on if you're interested. Uh, there's also a statistical component. Uh, so typically we have models with uh, numerous parameters. And you have some data at the beginning, and you, use to, uh, you need to use the data to fit your model. Uh, so you can make uh, realistic estimates. So you need parameter estimation. Uh, statisticians are interested in optimization issues, optimal control. Again, at the beginning of an outbreak, typically you have limited number of resources. How do you optimally allocate those? Uh, there are issues also to do with sensitivity and uncertainty associated with the, the whole modeling process. So you have many parameters, okay, two, three, four, five, ten, a hundred parameters. Uh, you're not 100% sure the value of the parameter, let's say beta, the transmission rate used in your uh, model. You say in the simulation it's 0 0.5, but maybe it's 0 0.45, maybe it's 0 0.6, okay? So there's uncertainty in the estimate of that parameter, just like there will be uncertainties in the estimate of all other parameters. So how do you take into account the effect of those uncertainties in, on the overall simulation results that you obtain? So you have to apply some techniques. Uh, Sally Blauer has uh, introduced the notion of uh, lighting hypercube sampling technique to uh, assess the impact of uh, uncertainties in parameter estimates. And sensitivity is to determine what are the most important parameters that drive the disease transmission process, for example. So if you say R0 is, let's say, beta divided by gamma, beta is the infection rate, 1 over gamma is the average duration of infectiousness, 
Okay, so for simple model loss, you are not. So which of the two parameters has the highest impact on determining the value of R0? So that's sensitivity analysis. You want to determine what are the most important parameters. And this also leads back to what Yasek was talking about. If you have a large model, you can get rid of many things that are not terribly important. If you do sensitivity analysis and you show that certain parameters are not really driving the process, you can set them to zero. It's a kind of model reduction strategy using sensitivity analysis. Okay, so if you do it right. So typically we use partial rank correlation coefficients. Uh, so that's also computational, computational aspects. Uh, you have large models, typically, uh, how do you, uh, you cannot solve them exactly. Sometimes even the uh, qualitative analysis are not easy, so you have to use some numerical techniques to try to find approximate solutions. Uh, some groups have mathematical software, they use high performance computing sometimes. Uh, some internet technologies, I know using uh, uh, Google search engines, for example, syndromic indicators for seasonal flu. Uh, this is a way to determine whether or not you have uh, flu activity by just counting the total number of times people in a particular community hit the Google search engine on flu, asking the question on flu. So you can use that syndromic indicator uh, as a predictor for flu activity. Again, the whole point of this is what we do is multidisciplinary in nature. Mathematicians working together with statisticians, with ecologists, with epidemiologists, with medical people, all together to address a common problem. That's really the main uh, point here. Okay, now the main lecture, compartmental modeling of infectious diseases. It might surprise some of you to know that this was actually started by public health physicians, not by mathematicians. The whole framework was started by the likes of uh, Carmack McKendrick, Saron Rose, uh, Bernoulli, of course, his work on uh, assessment of uh, data to uh, analysis of data to determine the efficacy of uh, smallpox, smallpox uh, vaccine is the only, is one of two vaccine preventable diseases that has been eradicated. Smallpox, second one being Rinderpest. Uh, so they started the mathematical framework for the compartmental modeling of uh, infectious diseases. Carmack McKendrick in particular, I'll focus on those. Ross McDonald, of course, Sarona Ross won the Nobel Prize in medicine in 1902 for his work on malaria. Uh, so how do we formulate an epidemiological model? So typically we use the compartmental modeling. Uh, Jacek also mentioned there are two main modeling types. Uh, this, um, either you use deterministic or stochastic. I'll focus on deterministic in this lecture. Um, the other modeling types too that we can talk about, uh, maybe mention later on, but the main ones are typically stochastic and deterministic. Um, so, so, we, 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 so the total population at time t, let's say n of t, is split into mutually exclusive compartments. Okay, so you cannot be in two compartments at the same time. You can only be in one. So n is the total population. I are those who are already infected at time t. S are those who are susceptible, so who are target, who can be infected. Okay, so again, the example I gave before, I'm the only one infected here. All of you are susceptible, so I'm the I of t. It's a class of one person, just myself, unfortunately. And you're all in S of t, okay? S of t are those who are susceptible, but who are potential targets, okay, who can be infected later. So, so the total population n, n of t is S of t plus I of t. The total population at time t is the sum of the susceptible population at time t and the infected population at time t. So here I do not include latency, okay? So you're just infected, either infected today or you've been infected for 10 days, doesn't matter, you're just in the I class. So then beta sub n is the effective contact rate. Okay, so if you are susceptible and I'm infected, you interact with me, suppose it's a, it's a respiratory disease like SARS, for example, or influenza. So your probability of getting infected depends on how many times you get contact with me. So the beta of n, we call it effective contact rate, it measures, it's an aggregate parameter. It's the, average, it's, it's the product of the probability of infection per contact times the number of contacts you have with me. It was an infected case or infectious case. So that's the, this is a formulation from Herbert Hesko's uh, very nice science review paper. Okay, so beta sub n, and then we count in the context made with the infectious fraction. Of course, if a susceptible interacts with another susceptible, nothing happens. Okay, so we're only interested in the context made uh, with the infectious fraction, i divided by n. 
So this is now the incidence uh, function. So there are two different types, so G of uh, SIN. Typically if the contact rate, ooh, if the contact rate is constant, then it's standard incidence, so beta of N is just beta, so you have beta SI divided by N. So your infection rate is beta SI, so you have, so you have, uh, so let's say the derivative S with respect to time is, let's say, initial birth rate, then minus beta SI divided by N. Okay, this is the infection rate here, uh, beta S divided by N. So this is, if you have the N in the denominator, this is uh, standard incidence. But if you say, so what this is, assumption is that the, your contact rate is constant regardless of where you are, okay? So the way I give an example is, okay, if you're here, if you're in a place, of, a city of one million people, and you, on average you see 10 people, and then you go to New York with four million people, for example, instead of seeing 40 people, you still see the same 10 people on average. So your contact rate is constant regardless of, uh, it's not a function of total population. The second one is the mass action incidence where the contact rate is scales to the total population. So in that case, if you replace beta of n now with beta times n, the n's cancel out and you just have beta si, and that's called the mass action incidence. Okay, so those are the typically the, the incidence functions used in basic uh, models for infectious diseases. There are many others. Yes, sir. Okay, that's what I want to ask because uh, I was just checking to see the recovery compartment. Ah, yeah, yeah. This is just basic, basic. Later on, we'll see recovery and others. Yeah, you are, you are ahead of the class already. <laughs> Very good. Well done. Yeah. When do you use the second one? Why do we use the second one? When Oh, when do we, good question, when do we use the second one? When do we say the, uh, your contact rate, effective contact rate scales to the total population? So I think typically with childhood diseases, you have children in, so in, in large schools, for example, then your kid is more likely to see more people in large schools than in smaller schools. So childhood diseases typically have mass action uh, incidents. Some, who can give me some other example of diseases? Mosquito bites, for example. Yeah, mosquito. Mosquito, no, I use, no. mosquito borne diseases, I use. No. Okay. Individuals. Ah, yeah, yeah. That's good. Yeah, so it's. By the way, actually, I was also talking about this actually giving the, the range of, of this. Perfect. Okay, good. So we we'll wait for the answer from Yasak tomorrow. <laughs> Mark Lewis, you have to say something about this. <laughs> no? Okay. Anybody else? Maybe you have one from airborne diseases. Airborne diseases? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, maybe, yes. Yeah. SARS, probably. Respiratory diseases. Excuse me. I, I have a concern. Um, for example, in a situation where you have anthrax breakout in people, that's a mass case. Anthrax? Yes. Okay. That could be mass action also. That is mass action. No, I think for those kind of diseases, I will not use mass action. I will not use standard incidence. I will use whole and type two, because people change their behavior in perceive of uh, serious uh, concern. How debilitating the disease is. How more likely you're to die. So whole and type two. So just like the Beverton Holt function we're talking about, there are certain incidence functions that you use depending on how deadly the people change their behavior more seriously or more quickly if it's a disease that will kill very quickly, like high fatality uh, rate. So I would, it depends on which disease we're dealing with here. Like for Ebola, for example, I might not use any of this. If you know you have like 70% chance of dying if you get Ebola compared to if it's only flu and you're, no? Plague, plague also, yeah, plague, exactly. So yeah, I would, use, I would use those kind of instance functions. Uh, I think Shigwe Ruan has used those in some of his papers. Uh, people modifying their behavior depending on how deadly the disease is. So different type, but typically whole and type two instance function. Also, I think in, in general, you can use this for small densities. Yeah. Yeah. I meet in unit of time the same number of people always. 
exactly. it's possible if you just have a very small density. Yeah. If you have a bigger density, then as you said, actually you build in like whole pipe, you know, because you need, a, you need some time to infect person. Yeah. Yes, so, so there is a handling time, and then therefore actually if it's big density, then you cannot hope that you will meet many individuals in a unit time. Many more individuals. So that actually is constant uh, rate of contact. So typically it's a small density approximation also. Very good. And this is also a notion used in physics, right? People say if you have two particles interacting, then the overall product is the product of their masses. So basically that's mass action typically. Uh, okay. So I was talking about R naught. Now I have an example here. Let's look at the first case here. So Red means you are infected, blue means you are susceptible. So if R0 is 2, the example I gave before, and I'm introduced into a completely susceptible, oh, so my definition was not entirely correct because I forgot to mention that one person, infected person, introduced into a completely susceptible population, okay? So everybody, well, everybody is susceptible except me, okay? So this is the case here. No prior immunities. I have a disease that you guys have never seen before, or no one is vaccinated against that disease. Okay, so it's completely naive population. So I'll just get busy infecting everybody. Okay, which is good. So that's what, so red here infects two others, and this one also infects two others, and before you know it, pretty much everybody will be infected. But this is a case with prior immunity, either through vaccination or maybe you've had it before, just like malaria. If you, if you had malaria, then you, you boost your immunity by repeated exposure to malaria. So the yellow ones are those with some kind of immunity. So you see, this is a much better situation because you have some infected, some susceptible, and some yellows. Okay, so you have a chance to control the disease here, but not here. Okay, so this is now R naught. This is the basic reproduction number. So the reproduction number in the absence of any intervention strategy whatsoever. But this is now typically the effective reproduction number where some kind of intervention is applied, either vaccination or isolation or quarantine, or some people have prior immunity because they've been exposed to the disease before, some kind of. Okay, and I forgot to mention when we're talking about the difference between mass action and standard incidence, from the mathematical point of view, it's much easier to do the analysis if you have mass action incidence. Because, I mean, it's still nonlinear because you have this quadratic term, but the nonlinearity is reduced because you do not have n in the denominator, s plus i in the denominator, okay? So it's much easier from a mathematical point of view to deal with mass action incidence. If you can get away with it, it's easier from the analysis point of view than with standard incidence. So Somebody had a question, yeah? Yeah, but then the question that arises is that the per capita rate of change of the susceptible lies proportional to the number of infected. How would you explain that there? The what? The per capita rate here? Yeah. Oh yeah, so you are susceptible you interact with somebody in I class, you have some probability that you get infected and that probability depends on how many contacts you have. So it's still the same definition. So beta is, is a rate, it's not probability alone, it's probability times the number of contacts per, per, per unit time you make with, and we only count the contacts with I, not with S and S. So it's still the same definition. It's the same framework formulation from here. Yeah, it's exactly the same, up to here are the same. The only distinction is what you define beta of n to be. If you say the contact rate is constant, then you have mass standard incidence, sorry. But if it's a, if it scales to the total population, then beta of n is beta times n. So that's, it's still the same. Yeah, you, yeah, mentioned, I just saw. you may mention that the word effective contact rate. Effective, yes. Means that, that includes the probability of getting infected is better. Exactly. So effective contact rate with probability of getting infected because we're only counting contacts between the susceptible and the infectious fraction. Yeah, very good. Yes, sir, I like the interaction. Please keep on talking. Go ahead. Oh, for I, yeah, yeah, for I, good. So, so, so again, you're saying the, the effective contact rate is linear. Is that realistic in nature? Ah, now you're asking a very difficult question. <laughs> Well, not only that, it's constant also. So, I mean, this should be a non-linear. But for s simple, I'm going to, because the talk is on Kamek mechanics, so I'm going to talk about Kamek mechanic formulation, the very first compartmental model, I think. Uh, so beta is linear, beta is constant, and, but this is, uh, this is a very difficult 
uh, issue. Uh, but, but yeah, you, you're preaching to the choir on this one. I like beta to be a function of many different things, uh, but not for today's lecture. Very good. OK. Uh, so I hope I'm not taking too much time. OK, so compartmental models, uh, I'm going to talk about the comic mechanical. So SIR means you split the total population. Somebody was asking me about recovery. OK, so now this is it, SIR. The model I was talking about earlier was just SI. So SI, now some of the infected people are, actually do recover from the disease. And once they recover, they do not lose the infection acquired immunity. They remain in the recovered class or they do not go back to S class. There's also the latent period E here. So it's susceptible. You go into the E class, which means you just got infected, but you are not infectious yet until after the incubation period. You become infectious and then move to the infectious class I, and then you recover. Again, when you recover, you do not lose immunity and go back to the S class. But there's another class of models, SIS. You, get, you are susceptible, you get infected, and then you lose recovery, uh, you lose immunity, sorry, and go back to S class. I have a question on this. I, I still think if you have already been infected, you do not become completely wholly susceptible like someone who has never been infected before. I think from the biological point of view, you, have, you still have some, some protection because of the infection. So there should be some, maybe the, yeah, so maybe they go back to some, not, not the S class, but some other S class, but not completely susceptible. Yeah, so that's my, anyway, so that's S-E-I-R-S. Again, you go back to S. So for this kind of models, typically they have disease-free solution. You set all the infected classes to zero, and they typically have a unique endemic equilibrium. So one equilibrium where uh, the I population is non-zero, E population non-zero, and so on. So there's disease situation, and there's uh, disease-free situation. One R naught is less than one. Uh, typically, we have the disease-free equilibrium is stable, so it's attracting solutions. When it's greater than one, the disease persists because you have a unique endemic equilibrium, which is stable. Okay, so typically for this kind of model, the dynamics of the model are characterized completely by the reproduction number. So if it's less than one, you have a uh, possibility of getting the disease at, uh, effectively control. If it's greater than one, you don't because the disease will persist in the population. So that's basically what it is uh, here. Yes, please. Excellent question. So when you say disease-free equilibrium, so public health people have a definition of really, I think, what is, like when they, we were talking recently about polio, when do we determine a country is polio-free? You know, so they, they, determine, they determine that based on saying, okay, if they have certain number of cases, less than a certain threshold for a certain period of time, then they can de determine that essentially to be a disease-free situation. It doesn't mean, when they say South Africa is polio-free, it doesn't mean there's not a single kid in this country who does not have polio. It just means you do not have a critical mass above a certain threshold. So that's really what it means. I mean, we take a limit as C tends to infinity to do this, all this analysis, but what is infinity? Infinity in the context of, let's say, Ebola, because as far as I know now, there's no Ebola going on. Am I, is that true? Guinea, Sierra Leone, anybody from Sierra Leone, Liberia? Guinea? That's one in probation. Okay, maybe the two others are not. Okay, so we can technically say, okay, well, okay, if you don't agree with my Ebola example, I can give another example, which I'm sure you'll agree. <laughs> SARS, severe acute respiratory syndrome. Nobody on planet Earth is infected right now with SARS. Humans, at least. I don't know about civet cats and other. Nobody is going to say that Ebola has been eliminated. Yeah, well, fair enough. In those two, co those two countries you're saying, Probably they'll say we, we, we have effectively controlled that, but maybe not necessarily eliminated. Yeah. So we're not. My point is, is the question in the real world, diseases come and go. We're not at equilibrium. Well, okay, so some come and go, yes, but for example, influenza is almost always here. Influenza. 
for example. HIV AIDS is always here. I mean, malaria is always here. So the types of diseases that come and go are the karmic mechanic type, which I'll show later. If, with that simple karmic mechanic model, the way it's formulated shows that diseases always come and go without affecting every member of the s s population. So you have the initial um, susceptible population at time zero minus susceptible population at the end of the disease, that is always a positive quantity. That's one of the major uh, uh, findings in karmic mechanic model. Okay? Diseases come and go without affecting every member of the population. I come with my disease, I infect a few of you, but I'm not going to infect everybody if I use karmic mechanic type model. That's what it will show. Okay? So I reach a maximum, come down to zero, and that's it. But with HIV AIDS, that's not the case reach a maximum, come down, stabilizes, then go back to AIDS. So, so it depends on many different I like the interaction. Keep on asking me questions. Go ahead. But you have to give me one more hour, right? <laughs> yes, I have, from the first presentation, integrating it with this one, it means that then diseases are very important in progression to equilibrium. Yeah. They are? Oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, so if, you have a disease that kills a lot of people, that will de destabilize the equilibrium, that will determine the size of the equilibrium. Then that means there is no need to be concerned about progression growth if the disease are there. <laughs> no, 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 but that's not what we want. We don't want a situation whereby there's a disease that kills a lot of people and we do nothing about it. No, we want to stop them. We want to anticipate possible diseases, especially those that will jump from animal population to human population. If we can stop them, we should stop them. Yes. Elimination. Yeah, absolutely. Not only elimination, yeah, but eradication the also. Be, you know, you decide to kill because it's going to affect others. <laughs> no, no, wait, say it again, say it again. Who, who do we kill? Who do we kill? The disease? <laughs> <laughs> I like that, I like that. The one who's not going to survive, perhaps, and this is going to increase the risk of affecting the po other population. Why would you kill that? Yeah, so I. I that's an example, but I cannot give it because it's been recorded. I will tell you privately. But yeah, so, so there, there are issues here. That, I mean, the, sometimes people use game theoretic approach. I mean, this is, he's raising a very important point, I think. So who do you, fo do you focus, uh, if you're a public health person, do you focus more on making sure you protect the entire population, or do you focus on only protecting the person who's infected? From the point of view of the person who's infected, of course, he needs to be, be treated. He needs to be well. But the, the overall, so it's a, it's, it's a how, it's difficult to, to, to say it, but the rights of the majority compared to the right of just a few that are infected. It's not an easy answer to, uh, an example recently in the United States, I think in California, there's outbreaks of measles and some parents were deciding not to send their, uh, the, the children to, to school. So, so, you know, so you, you, you may decide to say, well, I mean, if I send my child to school, it's likely that the child is going to get infected with measles. You know, parents may decide to opt out also to say, I'm not sending my child to, to school because of that. How do you do it? You, you can't, it's, it's, it's difficult. Uh, it's a very difficult issue. But I'll leave it to politicians to decide on that. The what? Yeah. Now, yeah. So that is the same situation. It depends on the circumstances. Yeah, but it's the same in Nigeria also the reason, uh, so, so yeah, they use the same definition of one to determine whether or not a country is free of a particular pathogen. So the same thing, it started in Lagos. Lagos had a very effective public health control system. Mm -hmm. So they were able to control it very quickly. Uh, but yeah, it was decided by the WHO that Nigeria was free of Ebola, I think, a long time ago. So. But that also does not mean there's not a single kid in Nigeria who... No, there's not. There's not. Really? <laughs> can, you, can you really be sure? Yeah, sure. Okay. Okay, if you say so, I agree. That's okay, but... I'm, I'm comfortable with the WHO declaration. Okay, if they say the country is free of Ebola, that's okay. Okay, let's do some mathematics. Okay, 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 okay. I, I, I'm running out of time. I really have to start doing some... Okay, at least show some mathematics, okay? I may not, okay. Uh, 
Okay, so what's the Carmack McKendrick? These are again public health physicians uh, who were working in the 1920s, I believe. Uh, so they split the total population and into S plus I plus R. So here we have recovered class. Bunch of assumptions, many of them I think have been mentioned by Yasek. So homogeneous mixing, okay? So everybody has equal likelihood of mixing with everybody else. Large population size, again, that justify the use of deterministic uh, model. Uh, okay, populations are small, then you have to really use a stochastic model. Exponentially distributed waiting times. So if you are in the E class, the number of days or years you spend in the E class is exponentially distributed. Okay, so you spend, so like 10 of us will be, anyway. Do you understand exponential distribution? Everybody? Waiting times in a particular compartment is exponentially distributed. Okay, someone will do a statistics talk later on and explain <laughs> this. Okay, closed population, also no entry and no de departure from the population, so it's really a closed population. Uh, time scale of the disease is faster than the actual demographic time scale, so that you don't include birth and death, okay? So again, diseases come and go, but the average lifespan in the community here probably is 70 years. Yes, sir? Okay, so let's say in the population, for example, de depends on which disease we're talking about here. Like HIV has been around for, I don't know how many years, since the 80s, okay? So the average lifespan here in South Africa is what, uh, 60 years, 70 years? So, so for diseases like that, you may be in trouble with this assumption. But for other, many other diseases like SARS, definitely that makes sense. Very good question. Anyway, to build models, as Yasek has mentioned, we have to make lots and lots of assumptions. And I think it's good upfront, before you start doing the modeling, to state what your underlying assumptions are. Okay? So that public health people, when they are judging your model, when they are deciding whether or not your, um, your recommendations are realistic, they have to judge that based on these assumptions. I think it's always good to, to, to list them. Okay, yeah, so this is the, okay, I, I have a slide for the, exponential distributed waiting time. So consider a group of people here who are all infected at some, at one time a unit, let's say U of S, okay? So U of S, these are all the cohort who are infected at some time unit, okay? Uh, who are still infected, who are, so who are still infectious, here infected means infectious, in this case S time units, after having been infected. So I was infected today, so 10 days later, as units of time, I'm still infected, okay, infectious. So if a fraction gamma of this actually leave the infected class in a unit of time, then this is the differential equation that captures that process. So du dt is just minus gamma u. So this is the guys, one over gamma is the um, recovery period, actually. You move to the recovery class. So you solve this, you get this. And then you see that this is uh, the fraction of infected that remain infected as units of time after having become infected is this term here, therefore the infected period or the infectious period is exponentially distributed with mean one over gamma. Okay, you just do this integration and then you see that it's one over gamma. So that's the idea. That's, so this model is built based on the understanding or based on the assumption that the infectious period is exponentially distributed and the mean of that is uh, one over gamma in this case. So this, again, this is the basic comic mechanic model, mass action, Beta is the infection rate, S is susceptible, I infected. No, it's a closed population, no demographics, no bus, no death, okay? So you are S, you interact with I, there's some probability, and uh, depending on the number of contacts captured by beta that you get infected. And so once you do so, you move immediately to this class I, and then you recover at rate gamma, and then move to the recovered class. And there's no loss of immunity, you don't go back to S. This is the basic comic mechanic model. Okay, so beta is the mean number of contacts, so effective contact rate, as we said, and one over gamma is the mean duration of infectiousness, how long you are infectious. So again, this is the main result, one of the main results. S naught is the number of susceptible people at the beginning. S infinity, number of susceptible people at the end of the disease. The difference is always positive using this model. Diseases come and go without affecting every member of the community. That's what this is saying. Yeah. How can you explain the minus sign? Oh, how do you explain the minus sign? Very good, because this is a lost term. 
So you are susceptible, the rate of change of susceptible population changes after acquiring infection. So if you become infected, you are no longer susceptible. You move to another compartment, the eye compartment. That's why it's negative. So all arrows uh, pointing to a compartment are positive. All arrows pointing away are negative. So this is uh, SI. So this, you are in the S class. You get infected at this rate beta. You immediately move to the I class. And if you recover, you move to the R class. OK, at rate gamma. Good question. Any other question? OK, a uh, little bit of algebra. OK, so suppose at time 0, S0 is n. OK, so the susceptible number, number of susceptible people at time 0 is n. Total number of people, OK? n is S plus t, S plus i, sorry. So at time 0, OK, at time 0, OK? So you are at time 0, actually. I just came in, time 0, starting from right now. I'm infected. Nobody else is infected, OK? Uh, so I will infect beta, which is my effective contact rate, times S0, right? The total number of people at time 0, S0. So and S0 is n, so this is beta n. So one infected person will infect beta times n at time, uh, per unit time. So this I'll infect beta n people per unit time. Therefore, I remain infectious for one, a period of 1 over gamma. Therefore, my R0 is beta S0 times the duration of infectiousness, which is 1 over gamma. This is the average number of new cases I will generate in a completely susceptible population. OK, everybody else is in susceptible. I'm the only one infected. And this is what it is, beta S0. So if I know beta, if I know gamma, I can all, at the beginning of any outbreak, I can estimate what R0 is. Because I know S0. I know the total number of subtotal people at time 0, which is the total population. So if I know the effective contact rate, and if we know from if pop, epidemiologists can tell us what 1 over gamma is, like how long people uh, remain infectious, I can e immediately estimate what R0 is using this very simple model. Uh, there's some analysis looking at the derivatives uh, to basically show the main property. If S0 is less than this quantity, that means R0 less than 1, then the population I of t decreases to 0. Okay? Uh, if the initial number of infectives is below this threshold, uh, sorry, initial susceptible people is less than ga gamma or beta, that means R0 is less than 1 then the population I of T infected class decreases to zero, which means there's no epidemic in this case. But if S0 is greater than this ratio, then R0 is greater than one, you have the infected class goes to, uh, you have a disease initially, and then, but eventually it comes down because DIDT is always decreased. DIDT is, uh, um, if and only if S greater than that, but I increases as long as S is greater than gamma or beta. Anyway, the point is, again, this is our R0, okay? Uh, if R0 is less than 1, infection dies out. If it's greater than 1, you have an epidemic using a simple karmic mechanic formulation. Uh, some algebra, I will skip this. The advantage of, okay, the reason, what I was trying to do is actually to show uh, this. Just some algebra. If, for example, K is the total population size at time 0, similar to the carrying capacity that Yasek was talking about. OK, let's say K is, there are like about 60 people here. So let's say K is 60 in this class. And uh, one person is introduced, infected person. OK, so what is going to happen? So we were able to do some basic algebra to show that this ratio beta over gamma, which you know is, if you may recall, is in our R0. Uh, R0 is, for this simple model, is beta S0, which means beta K divided by gamma. So I can write it in terms of the right-hand side, which is a log of the natural log here of S0, but I know what S0 is, initial number of susceptible people at time zero, so this is known. I also know at the end of the disease, I wait out the disease, so I know how many susceptible people remain at the end, so I know S infinity, and I know K, of course we just said it's 60, so I know the right hand side, which means I now know the left hand side, I know beta over gamma. If I know beta over gamma, I already know what R0 is, because R0 is beta over gamma times k. So using a simple model, we can find very good early estimate of the reproduction number using this kind of final size type calculation. So Fred Brower has done a lot of work on this. If you want to 
look at this kind of models and calculate the final size relation. You can in fact calculate the maximum number of infected people uh, time t. This is given by this kind of uh, expression. Uh, final size calculations are suited for emerging diseases such as SARS, pandemic, influenza, and now Zika virus. So Zika has jumped now from Zika forest in Uganda. My good friend from Uganda is here. And it's now somewhere in the Americas as well. So you can treat it as a, this kind of model of this kind of disease, uh, maybe not put in demographics, okay? And then try to do the final size calculations. Uh, SIS now, so I infected people, lose uh, infection acquired immunity and move back to the S-class at red gamma. The same idea, you can do similar type of analysis. You get the R0, the same R0 as before. And now in this case, you have uh, two solutions, uh, I star equal to zero, which is a disease-free solution, of course, which corresponds to S equals K, when I is zero, S is K. And the second equilibrium solution is the endemic one, K minus gamma or beta. Of course, this exists only if R0 is greater than one, because otherwise, it can be negative, so you don't want an equilibrium to be negative. So, so this exists if and only if R0 is greater than one. So you can, for this, we, we have this kind of situation. Uh, now we can put in demographics, so you can say the birth rate is mu times k, it's a fraction of the total number of people. Almost time. Ooh. Okay, minus the, bus, the death rate here, so infected people move here. This again is mass action, and gamma i is a recovery rate and here, recovery induces permanent immunity against, uh, so you do not lose um, recovery uh, immunity, sorry, you don't go back to S, so similar properties, you can get that. And this is linearization, you can linearize around the disease free solution, find all the eigenvalues, and require all the eigenvalues to have negative real part. This gives you the reproduction number, which is similar to the previous one, except now that the duration of infectiousness is one over mu plus gamma. The way to see it is, that. The way, actually you can design R0 by inspection. Without doing any of this analysis, you can tell what R0 is. What is R0? So you look at the infected class. In this case, it's only one class, I. So R0 from first principle is the infection rate, okay, which is beta times S star. In this case, S star is the value of S at the disease-free equilibrium. So that's the infection rate of a typical infected person times the duration of infectiousness of that person. So which is, so you ignore this term. So you have DIDT, you know this positive term is minus into gamma plus mu times i. Okay, you solve that. Again, you have this exponential um, solution with mean one over mu plus gamma in this case. That's it. That's your R0 straight away. By just looking at the equation, you can tell what your R0 is. So, so without doing all this algebra, you can tell. And then you can prove all the theorems. Uh, let me see if I have time for one more model. Oh yeah, so herd immunity, yeah, this is very important. So, so you suppose you vaccinate certain proportion. So this, let's say this is a model for childhood diseases. Okay, so maybe some disease where children, the minute they are born, they have to be vaccinated against some disease. So you can see that the reproduction number is now like this. It's the same as before, except now you have the one minus P term. The P is a proportion of people who are, are children who are vaccinated. Okay, so if P is one, if every child is vaccinated, then RV becomes zero, of course it's less than one, so you have a very good chance of uh, eliminating the disease. But, so what is the, what is the high immunity threshold? So you set RV equals one and you solve for P. You get the threshold value of P, which is the proportion of children, susceptible children who are vaccinated. So if P is greater than this, then you have, you achieve high immunity provided one minus one over R naught, uh, vaccinated. So that's typically, the, for simple models, this is what you need to do. If there's a new disease and you have a vaccine against the disease, what you really target is to vaccinate one minus one of this proportion. Okay? So if you do that, you will have a chance to make RV less than one, therefore you have uh, elimination of the disease. Some people will say, again, this is game theoretic stuff, okay? I remember also during uh, H1N1, uh, People are saying, well, I'll just wait until enough people in my community have been vaccinated so I don't have to be vaccinated. Right? Makes sense. It's game theoretic. You just wait enough as long, because then you benefit from the vaccination of other people. Enough people have been vaccinated so there's huge immunity in the community, therefore you don't need to be vaccinated. You can take that chance because being vaccinated sometimes there's a lot of toxicity, right? And it's also painful to be vaccinated. So, 
So anyway, so that's what some of the parents were saying also in, in, in for measles. They're saying, well, I don't want my child to be vaccinated. We will just wait until enough children, other people's children have been vaccinated, then my child will benefit from, from that. Again, you cannot force people to have their children vaccinated if they don't want to. So that's the, so for smallpox, for example, again, this is a success story. We have eliminated, we have eradicated smallpox using a vaccine. And I think there are other diseases now that are also on the verge of being eliminated. Or uh, one of which I think is human papilloma virus now. Mark Incorporated has come up with a really, this super duper vaccine, which, is, uh, which targets uh, some of the major subtypes of HPV. And I think it's possible that we, we will start talking about eradication. And the same thing with polio, just a few countries now. I mean, if we eliminate polio in those countries, we have eradicated. So for R0 equals five for smallpox, so you need to vaccinate at least 80% of the total population and you are done. I have a lot of slides to show. Unfortunately, I don't have time, uh, but yeah, that's, uh, these are the many of those. Yeah, so the summary of uh, the Kamek Mechanic, I'll stop right here. Uh, the models show that it, the disease goes up, comes down to zero, okay? That's basically Kamek Mechanic, and it comes and goes. Affects some people, but not all susceptible people. That's, these are the two main results. Okay, so almost every model we deal with in mathematical epidemiology are just extensions of Kamek Mechanic. Either you are putting in modes of transmission, maybe it's sexually transmitted disease or it's a vector-borne disease, or whatever it is, or you put it in preventive and treatment strategies, okay? A vaccination, uh, therapeutic, or loss of immunity, so it's SIS, or multiple infection stages like for HIV, so primary infections, secondary infection, AIDS stage, or you're putting age structure, Yasek was talking about age structure or risk structure, some people are more at risk, if it's sexually transmitted disease, for example, sex care work, uh, sex workers are more at risk. The elderly, in some other diseases, pregnant women. You put in evolutionary aspects, so resistance issues, or zoonotic, so animal, uh, diseases in animal populations, or socioeconomic, demographic. I mean, I mean, it's just extensions, some variant, some extensions of karmic mechanism. That's really what it is. And the other thing that I forgot to mention was uh, saronorosis, major contribution of saying, well, in order for us to effectively control malaria, we don't need to kill all mosquitoes. All you have to do is bring the number of mosquitoes below a certain threshold. That again laid this foundation for this R0 idea. So it's all about thresholds. Bring, bring the total mosquito abundance below a certain threshold, and then you have a chance. And that was what I think was used to eliminate malaria in some parts of the Western world. Uh, well, of course, they did a lot of DDT also, so, but that's the idea. So there are still mosquitoes in Canada. I used to live in Winnipeg for a while, and, but we didn't have malaria. We do have West Nile one, once in a while, but again, that's not a major issue. But there are still mosquitoes. You don't need to kill all mosquitoes to eliminate malaria or mosquito-borne diseases. Just bring their number below. Some, and this was Sarono Ross, long, long time ago. Thank you so much for your attention.